Hello everyone and welcome to this session on reinforcement learning by Intellipa. Self-driving car is a wonderful creation in 21st century. But have you ever wondered how the self-driving car works? This is with the help of reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is that area of machine learning that deals with training of machine learning algorithms by the principle of rewards and punishment so that the machine learns from the response of the environment and improves its further action. So in today's session, we'll learn all the concepts related to reinforcement learning. Before we move further, do subscribe to IntelliPath's YouTube channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss out on our upcoming videos. Also, if you want to become an expert in reinforcement learning, then IntelliPath provides you an end-to-end -end certification course on reinforcement learning. Now let's have a quick glance at the agenda. We'll start off by understanding what is machine learning. Then we'll look into the branches of machine learning. After that, we'll learn about reinforcement learning. Going further, we'll see the learning process involved in reinforcement learning. Further, we'll see the elements of reinforcement learning and the reinforcement learning processes. Following which, we'll discuss about multi-armed banded problems and the methods to solve exploration and exploitation dilemma. After that, we'll be discussing about Markov decision processes. And finally, we'll see how to compute policies and value function using Bellman's equation. So without any further delay, let's continue with this session. So let's have a brief introduction about machine learning. So you already know that a machine learning is the ability of a machine to learn by itself without being explicitly programmed. So we expose a machine to different experiences and based on the experience it, it uh, our machine learns from it and this whole process helps or this whole process happens without any explicit programming. And machine learning comes under artificial intelligence and uh, reinforcement learning also comes under artificial intelligence. So now let's discuss uh, the broad classifications of machine learning. So machine learning learning can be broadly classified into three categories. Uh, the first category is called the supervised learning, the second category is called the unsupervised learning and the third category is called the reinforcement learning which is the main topic for this course. So now let's have a brief introduction about uh, supervised learning. So in supervised learning we train our machine on a labeled data. So we have both input and our labels which is the correct input and output. So our machine knows uh, and it learns from the right answers. So once it learns from the right answers so then we supply our machine with new data and then it predicts new labels for us so in supervised learning uh, we have two classifications two categories uh, so for the first category is called the regression problems so in regression problems we predict continuous variables which are also called numerical variables uh, using supervised learning so we can predict some of the examples are given here so we can predict the stock prices or the product of different prices based on the previous data that we have supplied to our machine and we can also predict population growth based on different factors that are related to population growth once we supplied our previous data to our machine it will learn different patterns and correlations between different factors that are responsible for population growth and in the future it can predict for us uh, at what point of time how much population uh, growth will be there and then we can also predict weather so we can predict temperature or humidity or precipitation based on the previous data that we had supplied to our machine and it learned uh, different patterns and correlations from it so these all categories uh, we are predicting a numerical output or a continuous variable so that is why this is called a regression problem and the second kind of problems that we can solve using the supervised learning are classification problems where we classify or predict different categories so we can if we have 10 different images and if, if we want to know which image contains which object so if you want to classify images based on the people or animals or any other object that is contained in them so we can use uh, the supervised machine learning and then we have identity fraud detection so based on our previous fraud uh, fraudulent cases or fraud records when we supply those records to a machine so it will learn patterns and correlations from those fraud cases and in the future if it uh, if it finds any case that is suspicious and that is matching with the previous records or the previous patterns that our machine has observed then it will tag that particular transaction as a fraudulent transaction so this is uh, very helpful in banking transactions to detect so we can also use machine supervised machine learning in diagnostics to detect whether a patient has a disease or not and what is the level of disease that that patient has so that uh, in 
medical field also we can use supervised learning to classify whether a patient has a particular disease or not so the next type of category of machine learning is called the unsupervised learning so in unsupervised learning we train the machine on unlabeled data so in unsupervised learning our goal is to identify the underlying structure in the data so we have two types of unsupervised learning broadly classified into two types one is called the clustering and then we have dimensionality reduction so in clustering we try to find different groups inside the data and the underlying structure of the data so we can use for customer segmentation for different companies and then targeted marketing and then in, in our recommendation systems that are used by different websites like netflix youtube and then we have dimensionality reduction which contains big data visualization so we reduce the features or we combine the features so that we can uh, use different visualizations to visualize our data just a quick info guys if you are interested in doing an end-to-end -end certification course in reinforcement learning then IntelliPath provides the reinforcement learning training course. You can check out the course detail in the description below. Now let's continue with the class. So we are not going to go too deep into this uh, these concepts because our main focus for this course is uh, the reinforcement learning. So if you want to know more about these topics then you can follow the machine learning course. Uh, so now let's move ahead and discuss the third type of learning which is the main topic for this course that is reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning which is also called the online learning it is a type of machine learning where the machine learns from the environment. So instead of learning from a stored data which is also called the training vectors or machine learns from the whole environment. So the environment can be the real world or it can be a simulated world. For example in a video game the world is a simulated world and if you are trying to make a machine learning algorithm that plays a game for that particular machine learning algorithm or reinforcement learning algorithm the environment will be the particular game. So it is based the reinforcement learning is based on the concept of rewards. So every time a machine does something chooses the correct action so we will give it a positive reward and the reward is always a real number so if a machine does the action which is appropriate so we'll give a positive reward and if it is not appropriate we'll give a negative reward which is also called uh, the penalty so the goal of our machine learning or the reinforcement learning algorithm is that it has to maximize the number of rewards and the maximization is not only short term but it has to maximize the long term rewards so th the goal of a reinforcement learning algorithm is to maximize the scale rewards and the rewards are always a, a real number so we also say that reinforcement learning is a memoized search so our algorithm will search for the right ways to do something and it remembers that way so instead of just telling uh, what goal we want to achieve we just tell our machine learning algorithm or reinforcement learning algorithm to maximize the scalar rewards so now let's look at the process that is involved in our reinforcement learning so the main idea behind reinforcement learning is that we have an agent who is trying to maximize the scalar rewards and it learns from the environment and the reward is given by the environment to the agent so let's take an example where we have a footballer who is trying to score a goal. If the footballer is not able to score a goal and the goalkeeper catches the ball, so we'll give a reward of minus one. So it will be a negative reward. So once our footballer gets a negative reward, it knows that it uh, doesn't have to perform the same action again. So it will try to avoid the action that uh, gives it a negative reward. So next time if the footballer is able to score a goal, so we'll give a reward of plus one. So in reinforcement learning or agent, once it knows uh, that this action leads to the appropriate action, so it yields a good reward. So it, it will not only perform that action but also remember the action. So that is why it is also called a memoized search. So now let's discuss some of the uh, main elements or uh, some of the terms that are involved in reinforcement learning. So there are main basic seven terms. So there are a lot of other terms that will be introduced to you in the further modules. So then agent which is the first term that uh, I have already used before. So an agent is just uh, something that we are trying to put intelligence into. So the, our agent can be a robot or it can be a machine, an algorithm that plays a game. So the agent in RL is a component that makes decision of uh, what action to take take so we we also call the agent as a decision maker and then we have something called environment so environment is the setting on which the agent is performing the action so the environment is everything that the agent is working on so environment can be a real world so for if we have a robot and he's trying he's learning how to work so its environment will be the whole world of the path that he's trying to walk on and then environment can be a simulated world so it will be a game uh, so if, if our agent is trying to learn how to play a game so that environment will be uh, the game environment for that particular agent and then we have a state so a, in a state we define what are the different characteristics and what is the current situation of an agent so if uh, an agent for example if you take the example of our footballer and you know, when a footballer scores a goal so that will be a particular state 
where it, it got a reward and the other state will be when a, when it doesn't score a goal so that will be a, that will be another state and if you take the example of a robot if the robot is trying to walk so it will take the right step so once it takes the right step and it is still stable so we say that is another state and if it takes another step and it destabilizes itself and it falls down so that will be another state and then we have action so if you take the football example so the action will be kicking the football so if uh, and the direction in which uh, the footballer will kick the football and the speed that uh, it will take to click the football so that will be a particular action uh, so the action are the agents methods which allow it to interact with its with its environment and thus transfer between states so after taking an action an agent will transfer from one state to another so if you have a robot who is trying to learn to walk so once it takes an action that is uh, the action will be uh, put the right leg in front of it so that will be an action and once it is the action is done so that robot will be in new position so that position will be a new state so uh, the transition between different states happens because of actions so when a robot or when an agent takes an action it will either yield a negative reward or it will either yield a positive reward and uh, the job of the environment is to give the positive or negative reward and based on our goal that we are trying to maximize we'll either get a positive reward and negative reward based on the actions that an agent takes from one state to another and then we have something called policy so it is uh, policy is a mapping from one state to another so if you are in one state uh, so if you take the example of a robot uh, which is still standing so there are different actions that robot can take so a policy will define which action is the best one and uh, what action should we the robot take so that it receives the best reward so it is just a mapping a policy is a mapping from a state to an action and then we have something called value function so we use value functions to define policy so value functions actually determine which is the best action at a, in a particular state so we have multiple actions in a particular state and each action has a, a particular value function and each state also has a particular value function and based on those value functions we define a policy that our agent will use to select an action or transition between different states and it is noted by v of s we will learn more about these concepts in the coming modules so now let's see what are the different type of rl agents that we can use and we can train so now let's discuss some of the types of rl agents that we can uh, will use in this course so there are two types of rl agents one are the model based agents which keep an explicit model of the environment so a model is just a representation of how the environment changes when an agent performs an action or transitions from one state to another so if a model if an rl agent keeps the whole, the model or the representation of the whole environment and how it changes when it takes an action so that those uh, models will be or those agents will be model based agents and they have to uh, compute value functions and policies at every single time and uh, they may not have value values or policies function uh, also so we'll discuss this later on uh, in detail so in the next step of RL agents can be model free RL agents. So these agents they do not keep any representation of how the environment changes when they take an action or the transition from one state to another. So they calculate value functions and policy functions to take uh, decisions and to move from one state to another and to choose which action to take from moving from one state to another. Now let's discuss some of the problems that we can solve using the reinforcement learning methods. So the first type of problems that we are going to solve in this course is are called the multi armed bandit problems. So these problems also require uh, the sequential decision making. So we are teaching our agents how to make decisions in a sequence. And uh, the first type of problems that we are going to discuss are the multi-armed bandit problems. So we'll discuss uh, this in the in detail in the next module. Also in the next module, we'll also discuss the Markov decision processes, which are also used for uh, making decisions under uncertainty. And how we'll see how Markov decision processes are different from multi-armed bandit problems, and what are the similarities, and what are, what are the similarities, and what are the different techniques that we can use to solve these problems. So let's start with the first class of problems that we can solve using the reinforcement learning called the multi-armed bandit problem. So the multi-armed bandit problem or the k-arm bandit problems are used to formalize or define the problem of decision making under uncertainty. So the idea behind the multi-armed bandit is that you have a slot machine which is also called a bandit uh, because its sole purpose is to loot your money. So a multi-armed bandit has multiple levers or if we have uh, multiple bandits with a single lever then also we say that we have multi-armed bandits. Bandits. 
and how it works is that you have, you put a coin inside the machine and then pull a lever attached to it and if you are lucky enough you will get a reward or otherwise you will not get a reward and end up losing your money so in this scenario you are an agent and you have to choose between k different actions which in this case are k different levers of these bandits and then receive a reward based on the action and we also believe that there is a probability distribution for the reward uh, reward corresponding to each lever which actually means that there will be at least one lever which gives us more reward and the reward distribution for every lever is different and is unknown to us or the gambler who is playing the game so this is why we say that it is a problem of decision making under uncertainty so our goal here is to identify which lever to pull in order to get the maximum reward after a given set of trials just a quick info guys if you are interested in doing an end to end certification course in reinforcement learning then intellipath provides the reinforcement learning training course you can check out the course detail in the description below now let's continue with the class so now let's see some use cases where the multi armed bandit problems are used so our first use case will be clinical trials so suppose you are a doctor and you want to test three different medicines on your patients in order to know which medicine works the best so you give the first medicine to a patient and the patient turns out to be satisfied with it and then you give the second medicine to the next patient and he turns out to be unsatisfied with it so you would keep on doing this until you have enough information about the effectiveness of the medicines so this problem constitutes as a bandit problem since we have three different medicines to choose from and we are uncertain about the effectiveness of these medicines and our next use case is the online advertising so suppose you have three different versions of the same ad and you want to know which ad has the highest click through rate so you start by displaying the first ad to the first customer or first ad to uh, on your website and the first person who logs on to your website clicks on the ad and then you display the second ad on your website and the next person who logs on to your website does not click on the ad and then you display the third ad on your website and the person who logs on to your website does not click on the ad so you would keep on doing this until you have enough information about the ad having the highest click through rate so this problem also constitutes as a multi armed bandit problem since we have three different versions of a same ad and to choose from and we are uncertain about the click through rates of these ads so now let's discuss a very important concept in reinforcement learning called the action values so in our online advertisement example if you already knew which ad has the highest click through rate so it would be very easier for us to choose which ad to display but that does not happen in real life so we will run many trials until we have enough information about the click through rates but one thing we can do is we can use all the previous collected data to know which ad is best so far so we'll quantify the value of taking each action uh, which in our case is uh, in our example is choosing which ad to display using the action values so the value of selecting an action q star is the expected reward received after that action is taken so the goal of an agent is to maximize the expected reward and that can be achieved by selecting the action among all the actions that an agent can take that has the highest value so the value of q star which is the expected reward received after an action has been taken is actually unknown to us beforehand so we would have to find a way to estimate the value of q star so that we can choose the best action which in our doctor example is the best medicine so we'll use a method called the sample average method to estimate the action value for a particular action so the action value for an action a at time t is the sum of the rewards received when a action a was taken before time t divided by the total number of times action a has been taken before time t so in our doctor example if the patient is satisfied with the medicine then we will give a reward of plus 1 and if the patient is not satisfied with the medicine prescribed by the doctor we will give a reward of 0 so now let's see how action values are calculated using the sample average method in our clinical trials example so the doctor prescribes the first medicine to a patient and the patient turns out to be satisfied with the medicine and hence we will give a reward of plus 1 to this action so the action value for this action is 1 since the total reward received till now is 1 and the action has only been taken once and similarly the action values for the second and the third action are zero since we have not taken this action before this particular action so now another patient comes in and the doctor prescribes the first medicine to the patient and the patient turns out to be unsatisfied with it and hence will give a reward of zero and the third patient comes in and this time the doctor chooses the second action which is the second medicine and the patient turns out to be satisfied with the medicine and then the fourth patient comes in and this time the doctor chooses the third medicine and the patient turns out to be unsatisfied with the patient unsatisfied with the medicine so we'll give a reward of zero to this particular action so now 
now if we calculate the action values up to this point we'll get the following action values and suppose we keep on doing different trials uh, for the medicines and then at the 12th trial we end up with the following action values so as you can see the more trials we perform uh, the closer our action values estimate gets to the actual action values so now we have the action value estimates for each action and now if the doctor wants to choose which medicine to prescribe to the next patient so we have two options either he can choose the medicine having the highest action value which is called a greedy action where he exploits the current knowledge he has about the action values or he can choose the other two medicines so that he can find a more accurate estimate for the action values which is also called selecting the non-greedy action or exploring in order to get closer to the actual action values so now we have come down to the process of selecting the actions so the greedy action is when we choose the current highest estimated value which means that we are exploiting the current knowledge that we have or we can choose to explore further by selecting the non-greedy action hoping that we'll get more information about the other actions but an agent can only select one action at a time either the greedy or the non-greedy so that brings us to this challenge that we face in reinforcement learning called the exploration versus exploitation dilemma so the exploration allows an agent to improve its knowledge about each action in order to gain a long term benefit and on the other hand the exploitation allows the agent to choose the greedy action and try to get the most reward this time that may be for a short term benefit and one issue with exploitation is that it can lead to a suboptimal behavior so let's discuss how it can lead to a suboptimal behavior with an example so in our clinical trials example if we choose to exploit after the first trial where which is the q1 so we'd keep on choosing the first action because it has the highest estimated value but we know that after 12 trials or second action as we explore more we find that the highest reward is actually returned by the second action so that is how if we do not choose the right point of exploitation we can fall into this trap where we choose a suboptimal action instead of choosing the optimal action so now how do we actually know when to explore and when to exploit so that we do not end up choosing a suboptimal action so now in order to learn how to balance exploration and exploitation Let's discuss our first method which is called the Epsilon Greedy. So Epsilon Greedy is a simple method to choose between exploration and exploitation. So in Epsilon Greedy, the Epsilon which is typically a small number, it refers to the probability of choosing when to explore. So in Epsilon Greedy, we mostly behave greedily by selecting the greedy actions. But once in a while, we'll choose an action randomly among all the actions with an equal probability of epsilon without considering the current action value estimates. So this is how we actually choose an action in epsilon greedy. So a random action is chosen with the probability epsilon and for the rest of the time we choose to exploit the current highest value estimate. Here the argument max a simply means that we need the action or we want to find the action that maximizes the current value estimates which is given by q of a. So by doing that we, say we sample every action among all the actions an infinite number of times and we ensure that all the action value estimates they converge to the actual action values of those actions. So we choose to explore epsilon percentage of the times and we exploit 1 minus epsilon percentage of the times. And the typical values that we use for epsilon and or for exploring are 0.01 which is 1%, 0.05 that is 5% and 0.1 that is 1%. So this is a pseudo code that we'll use for epsilon greedy. So here we take p as a random number between 0 and and one and if the value of p turns out to be less than the value of epsilon that we have chosen we'll select a random action which is also called exploration and otherwise we'll choose to exploit by choosing the current best action so now let's go to the jupyter notebook and implement epsilon greedy algorithm in python so we'll start by importing the required packages that is numpy and matplotlib so numpy will use for creating arrays and functions related to arrays and then we'll use matplotlib for plotting or values and after that we have defined a class called actions which will be used to define the attributes and the methods related to our actions so the constructor of the class takes one parameter that is m which is actual value or the actual action value for our action and we have defined two instance variables that is mean and n where mean will be your estimated action value and n will be the number of times we want or epsilon greedy algorithm to run next we have defined a function called choose which will randomly choose an action from the, from the actions that will pass to our class and then we have also 
defined an update function which will update the value of the estimates after we choose an action x. Then we have defined a run experiment function which takes different values of m1, m2 and m3 which are the actual values for three actions. And we also pass a value of epsilon as EPS and NH stands for the number of times that we want our epsilon greedy algorithm to run. So we want our run experiment function to return the cumulative average as a list named data. So our list named data will contain the estimated values for our actions after the n runs are completed. So here you can see that we have defined our epsilon greedy algorithm inside this for loop where we have taken p as a random, random number between 0 and 1 and the value of p if it turns out to be less than the epsilon that will pass to this function then it will randomly choose an action among the three actions and otherwise it will choose the action with the best current value or the current value estimate. After that we will plot our cumulative averages that we have defined above and we'll compare it with the actual values uh, which our actions have to see how, how our epsilon greedy uh, works on different values for the actions and we'll plot this in log scale as well so that we can see the fluctuations in the earlier rounds clearly since the later data is squished in a log scale and in the last we have printed the value of, of the estimates that our epsilon greedy will calculate so after that we'll run our experiment just a quick info guys if you are interested in doing an end-to-end -end certification course in reinforcement learning, then IntelliPath provides the reinforcement learning training course. You can check out the course detail in the description below. Now let's continue with the class. With three different means which are the actual values for our actions. So the first section has a mean of 1, second action has a mean of 2 and the third action has a mean of 3. So among these three means, our action 3 has the highest mean. So our epsilon greedy should converge to this mean because this action has the highest return or reward. So here we have chosen an epsilon of 0.1 which means 10% so our epsilon greedy algorithm will explore 10% of the times and 90% of the times it will exploit and we will run the epsilon greedy algorithm 100,000 times. So this is the plot that we get after running our epsilon greedy algorithm 10% of the 100,000% uh, 100,000 times with epsilon as 10%. So these are the estimated values for each action that our epsilon greedy value or epsilon greedy algorithm has calculated. So the actual value was 1 and it has calculated this value and the actual value was 2 for our second action and our epsilon greedy algorithm has calculated this value and the actual values for action 3 which our epsilon greedy has calculated this particular value and this is the graph which our epsilon greedy uses for different iterations and in the last iterations when it reaches 100,000 iterations it normally almost converges with our best mean or the best action that we will we'll have defined and now we'll run this experiment with the same three different three means 1 2 and 3 and now we'll choose an epsilon of 5% that is 0.05 and this is the plot that we'll get and these are the estimated values for three different actions that our epsilon greedy algorithm will calculate and now if we run this experiment with epsilon as 0.01 which is 1% so here you can see these are the estimated values that our epsilon greedy algorithm has calculated and this we have run this for around 100,000 times. So now we'll compare these three epsilons in a single plot. So we'll firstly plot a log scale plot. So in a log scale plot our initial values are expanded and the last values are converged or they are squished. So here you can see the green line represents the epsilon value of 0.01 which is the 1%. So this epsilon greedy algorithm will explore 1% of the times and then we have epsilon equals 1 or epsilon equals 0.1 which is 10% of the time so our blue line will explore 10% of the times and our orange line will explore 5% of the times so in the beginning rounds you can see the algorithm that is BA that is performing the best which is our orange line that is 5% but later on when the runs become huge so you can see the green line it is closer to the best value estimate that is 3 and now if you compare different epsilon values using a linear plot which won't show you the actual fluctuations in the beginning so our log scale plot will show us the actual fluctuations between different values of the epsilons that we have taken so now that we have discussed the epsilon greedy algorithm and before knowing the limitations of epsilon greedy and moving to the next algorithm uh, let's first discuss an important concept that we'll use throughout the course so now we know how to calculate action values using the sample average method uh, but now we'll turn to the question of how these averages can be computed in a computationally efficient manner 
So the obvious implementation is to maintain a record of all the rewards that we have received and then perform this computation uh, where we estimate the new value whenever we need the new estimated value. However, if this is done, then the memory and the computation requirements would grow over time as more rewards are received. So each additional reward will require additional memory to store it and then an additional computation to compute the sum of this particular numerator. So to overcome this problem, we will write the sample average method in a recursive manner and by doing so we can avoid storing all the previous data. So this is the equation that says the same thing that we will sum all the rewards divided by total uh, the number of times we have taken that action. So we'll overcome this problem by writing our sample average method in a recursive manner and to do so we are going to take out the current reward out of this summation which is Rn. So now the sum only goes until the previous reward and now we'll write our next value which is Qn plus 1 in terms of our previous value estimate that is Rn minus 1. And so to do so we'll multiply our summation term with we'll multiply and divide the summation term with n minus 1 and by doing so we'll actually we are just actually multiplying by 1 because these two terms will cancel out n minus 1 so now if you look closely at the summation term this is just the definition of our qn which is the current value estimate so we can simplify this equation a little further so we'll distribute qn to get this form and finally we'll pull out the nqn term from here and multiply by 1 by n so we'll get this equation so now we'll have an increment update rule for estimating values uh, where alpha is a function of n and which is typically a number between 0 and 1. So we can write this equation in this form. So in this equation the error in the estimate is the difference between the old estimate and the new target and to reduce the error we will take a step towards the new target and that will create a new estimate. And here the target value is the new reward and the size of this step will be determined by your step size parameter and the error in the old estimate. So now we have an equation that we can use to update the action values incrementally without storing the previous values. So let's say if the value of alpha is set to 0 0.1 which is very small number then the most recent rewards which is qn will have more effect on our new estimate and if the alpha value is more that is say 0 0.9 then our new estimate will have more weight of the previous rewards as well. So this concept is actually used when our reward distribution changes with time. So the value of the rewards by taking the same action change with time and which we also call as a non-stationary bandit problem. So we'll use this rule throughout the course to solve our non-stationary bandit problems. So as we have already discussed the epsilon greedy and the incremental update rule. So in epsilon greedy one problem is that we'll eventually get to a point where we are still exploring when we actually don't need to explore anymore since we would have already found the best action value estimate. So now we'll move ahead and discuss the next method for balancing exploration ex and exploitation called the optimistic initial values. So in optimistic initial values method we balance the exploration and exploitation by being optimistic in the face of uncertainty. So instead of defining the initial values as zero we we'll define a non-zero initial estimate to encourage early exploration. So the first time any action is taken the observed reward will be smaller than the initial estimate which is set by us and by doing so the estimated value for the chosen action will decrease compared to the other actions and hence all the other actions will be explored more. So now let's discuss this concept with the help of an example. So we'll take an example of online advertising. So we have three different versions of the same ad and we want to know which ad would have the highest click through rate. So instead of initializing the action values estimates to zero, I will behave optimistically by making the initial values for each action as two. And to make sure we are definitely overestimating, we have set the values as two. And let's assume that we always choose the greedy action that is the value the action that has the highest estimated value. So we'll use the incremental update rule and we'll take the alpha as 0.5 for this demonstration. So the first person logs onto the website and because the values of actions are equal right now so we'll choose an, an ad randomly. So we choose the first ad to display and the person clicks on the ad and we'll give a reward of 1 and now if you calculate the estimated values you can notice that the estimated value for the first ad will decrease from 2 to 1.5 even though the ad was a success. 
and this is because the reward was 1 which is actually less than our initial optimistic estimate of the value so now the next person logs on to the website and so we can choose amongst the ads uh, which has the highest estimated value so we have add 2 and add 3 so we'll choose the second ad to display and the person does not click on the ad so we'll give a reward of 0 and then it will lower the estimated value for the ad so now the estimated value has decreased to 1 uh, which is actually lower than the estimated value for the first ad. So now let's say the third person logs onto the website and since the ad 3 has the highest estimated value so we'll choose ad 3 to display and the person clicks on the ad so they will give a reward of 1 and now if you calculate the estimated values we'll uh, the estimated values will decrease to 1.5 so therefore people will keep logging onto the website and will continually display the ads and refine the value estimates so from this example we can see that using optimistic initial values encourages exploration early in the learning and we have tried all the three ads in the first three steps you can see here and we'll continue to try all the three ads afterwards so now let's go to the Jupyter Notebook and implement optimal initial values, optimistic initial values and compare it with Epsilon Greedy to see which method performs better. So this is our first algorithm that is Epsilon Greedy that we had implemented before. This is our Epsilon Greedy. So we will just have to change this code. So now let's go to our optimistic initial values, how we define that function. And now we have set the run experiment function for our Epsilon Greedy as run experiment EPS. So we'll define our optimistic initial values function. So here in this class, which is our actions class for optimistic initial values, instead of keeping the mean, which was zero before, we'll keep an upper limit, which we'll define as a number, which is highly overestimating or our initial value estimate that we'll keep for our actions. So instead of zero, which was in EPS, we'll keep an upper limit. And then we'll define a function called run experiment, which is for our optimistic initial values. And here we have defined the upper limit as 10. So our initial value for the action value estimates will be 10. And then we have our three actions M1, M2 and M3, which will contain the actual values for uh, these actions. And n is the number of times that we want to run our algorithm for. So we'll define our optimistic initial values function here which is just to choose the best action or the best estimated value in all the actions. So if we plot our, now if we plot our EPS which is our epsilon greedy algorithm. So these are the three action values for our three actions and we have chosen an epsilon of 1 or 10 percent that is 0 0.1. And we are running this algorithm for 100,000 times. So we'll get this type of plot here. And these are the estimated uh, values which are calculated by our epsilon greedy algorithm. So now if we run our optimistic initial values function with three actual means. And since our upper limit is 10, so it means our action values will start from 10. Initial optimistic initial values will be 10. And we'll run this for same hundred thousand times so here you can notice in optimistic initial values since we have explored in the beginning so in the beginning you will see that our algorithm explores a lot in the later runs it converges to uh, the best action value that is three and these are the estimated values by our optimistic initial values algorithm and now if we compare both of these algorithms to see which performs better so we'll compare it using the log scale first which will show us this kind of plot so here you can see the orange line is our optimistic initial values and the blue line is our eps algorithm so here you can clearly see that in the beginning or orange line it explores a lot but in the later runs of the algorithm we can see that it performs better than our eps which is one percent which will explore one percent of the times and our optimistic initial values is the blue uh, is the orange line and then you can compare it using and the linear plot as well so in the linear plot also you can see that our eps which is the one percent exploring epn eps and the optimistic initial values so the orange line which is for the optimistic initial values it performs better than our eps algorithm so as we have already discussed the optimistic initial values method but one limitation of optimistic initial values method is that it drives exploration only in the early rounds and this means that the agent will not continue to explore after some time and this leads to issues in the non-stationary problems where the value of one action may change after some number of time steps so an optimistic agent will not notice that a different action is actually 
better now and another limitation is that we may not always uh, know how to set the optimistic initial values because in real life scenarios we may not know the actual reward or the maximum reward that we can get from an experiment uh, but we often use the optimistic initial values approach in combination with other exploration approaches so now let's move on and discuss the third approach for balancing exploration and exploitation which is called the upper confidence bound action selection so the upper confidence bound action selection actually uses the uncertainty in the estimates to drive exploration so since we are estimating our action values from a sample set of rewards and not the whole population of the rewards so there is always an inherent uncertainty in the accuracy of our estimates so it would be better to select actions among the non greedy actions for exploration according to their potential so if their potential is actually being optimal uh, so which can be done by taking into account both how close their estimates are to the maximum and how uncertain those estimates are so we use upper confidence bound to select actions using the uncertainties in those values so this is the formula uh, that we use to calculate the upper confidence bound for a particular action so we'll select the action that has the highest estimated value plus our upper confidence bound exploration term so here t is the number of steps that we have taken so far and n is the number of times that we have taken the action a uh, the c parameter here is a user specified pra parameter that actually controls the amount of exploration so we can clearly see how ucb actually combines both exploration and exploitation so the first term here is called the exploit term so this represents the exploitation part and the second term represents the represents the exploration part so let's discuss this with the with the help of an example so here q of 1 represents our current estimated value for action 1 and the box is a confidence interval around q star of 1 which says that we are confident that the actual value of action 1 lies somewhere in this region so the upper line is called the upper bound and the lower line is called the lower bound and the region in between is called the confidence interval which uh, represents our uncertainty so if the region is very small we are very certain that the actual value of action one is near our estimated value and if the region is very large so it means we are uncertain that the value of action 1 is near our estimated value that is q of 1 so in upper confidence bound we say that if we are uncertain about something so we should optimistically assume that it is the best choice for example we say we have this four actions here and we have the associated uncertainties with our actions so our agent right now has no idea which is the best action so in ucb it will, it will automatically or it will optimistically pick the action that has the highest upper bound so which is q of 1 here so by taking this action either we'll get a good reward or we'll get a reward or by taking if we don't get a reward we'll get to learn about this action that we know least about because confidence or the uncertainty in this particular action is large so we'll get to know about this action if we don't get a reward So let's say we take that action and we don't get any reward so the value of q of 1 will now decrease since we have added another example to our sample and also our confidence interval will shrink since we have added another example to our sample now our ucb will select the action that has the highest upper bound so right now the action that has the highest upper bound is q of 2 and let's say that we get a reward after selecting this action so now our estimated value will increase and since we have added another example to our sample so our confidence interval also shrinks so, so the more number of examples we add to our confidence intervals it shrinks because we then get closer to our actual values so again since q of 2 has the highest upper bound so it will be selected again and let's say this time we don't get any reward after selecting q2 for repeatedly for the n number of times so which means that the estimated value will decrease and the confidence by interval also shrinks so now our algorithm will select the action which has the highest upper confidence bound that is action 3 and suppose we get a reward so the estimated value of this action will increase and also the confidence bound will decrease or it will shrink so now we'll keep on doing this until we eventually get to an action that has the highest action value so this is how the ucb algorithm converges to the best value and it will select the action that has the best value based on the confidence bounds and the uncertainties in the estimates so now let's compare the upper confidence bound and the epsilon greedy algorithm and see which algorithm performs better so this is the plot actually that we get after plotting the ucb and the epsilon greedy and here you can clearly see that our ucb algorithm which is represented by the orange line it performs better than our eps 
which is sorry epsilon epsilon greedy with 10% exploration rate and since in the beginning rounds only we can see that the ucb algorithm performs better it will, because it will choose the optimal action and the optimal action is chosen on basis of both uh, the higher estimates and uh, the uncertainties in those estimates and later on also you can see in later rounds our ucb is still performing better than our epsilon greedy so after learning about the multi-armed bandit problems which introduce many in interesting questions however they do not include many aspects of the real world problems such as when the agent is presented with the same situation and each time it will choose the same action so in many real life problems different situations call for different actions so these actions we choose right now will affect the amount of reward we can get into the future. So that brings us to our next set of problems that we can solve using the reinforcement learning methods called the Markov decision processes. So MDPs or the Markov decision processes are used to define the problem of sequential decision making where the current actions are not only influenced by the immediate rewards but also the future situations or states. So the bandit problem, they do not take into account for the fact uh, that different situations may require different actions. But in MDPs, we balance uh, the trade-off between the immediate reward and the delayed rewards. And the future state and reward will only depend on the current state and the action. So it does not depend on the previous action and the time of the action. The future state and the reward, it will only depend on the current state and action, which is also called as the, as the Markov property. So let's discuss this with the help of an example. So let's take a robot as our agent and whose goal is to solve this maze and also by collecting the objects along the way. So each object has a specific reward associated with it. So if a robot collects a rugby, uh, it gets a reward of plus 10. And if it collects a flag, it gets a reward of plus 5. So now if you follow the approach of a multi-armed bandit problem, we'll choose the action that generates the maximum reward. So that is the robot will choose to go left. But now the robot, uh, this is left from our side. So that is right from the robot's side. So now when the robot will choose to go for the rugby, but now the robot is in a different situation uh, where it cannot go further since there is a wall in front of it. And when it hits the wall, it will get a reward of minus 100. So but now if you follow the framework of a Markov decision process or MDP, the robot will choose to go and collect the flag instead of the rugby because it knows that after collecting the flag it will be able to solve the maze and by solving the maze it gets a reward of plus 100. So this is one such situation where accounting for delayed rewards maximizes our total reward. So we can formalize this interaction uh, with the general framework. So in this framework the agent and environment they interact at different time steps. So at each time t the agent will receive a state s of t from the environment and it is from the set of all the possible states that is script s. So based on this state, the agent will select an action that is A of T from the possible set of actions that we have, which is A of S. For example, if our agent selects to move left to collect the rugby ball, so that will be our action A of T at time 0 or time 1. So one step later in the part of the agent's action, the agent will find itself in a new state that is ST plus 1. For example, if the state war where the action is taken and the robot is in a new state where the robot is next to the wall after it collects the rugby ball and the environment it will also generate a scalar reward that is RT plus 1 which will be drawn from the set of possible rewards that is script R. So in this case the reward is plus 10 for collecting the rugby ball. So this diagram actually summarizes the agent environment interaction in, in an MDP framework. So the agent environment interaction generates a trajectory of experiences. So this is a trajectory of experiences consisting of the states, actions and the rewards. So states will be as 0, A0 and the reward will be generated when the state transitions from one state to another. So the actions influence immediate rewards as well as the future states and through those future states the future rewards. So as in multi-armed bandit problems, the outcomes in an MDP are stochastic. So which means that the, when the agent takes an action in a state, there are many possible actions or there, may, there are many possible next states and rewards. And therefore, we use the language of probabilities to define the dynamics of an MDP. And we do it by defining a probability distribution. So here the transition dynamics function P defines this notion. So in a finite MDP, given a state S and action A, P tells us the joint probability of the next state that is S prime and a reward R. So since P is a probability distribution, 
which is called the dynamics function or the dynamics of the MDP. So it must be non-negative and its sum over all the possible next states and rewards must be equal to 1. And also note that the future state and the reward, they only depend on the current state and the action, which is called the Markov property. So which actually means that the present state is sufficient enough and remembering the earlier states would not improve the predictions about the future. So now let's discuss MDP with the help of an example. So let's consider a recycling robot which collects empty cans in an office environment. So it can detect the cans and pick them up and drop them off in a recycle bin. So the robot actually runs on a rechargeable battery and its goal is to collect as many cans as possible. So we'll start with the states, actions and rewards. So let's assume that the sensors can only differentiate between two charge levels that is low and high. So these charge levels actually represents uh, the robot's state. So in each state, the robot has three choices. So it can either search for the cans for a fixed amount of time or it can remain stationary and wait or it can go to the charging station and recharge its battery. So we allow only recharging from the low state because recharging is pointless when the energy level is already high. So now let's draw the transition graph for this particular MDP. So first uh, let's try the states using the circles high and low and searching the cans when the energy level is high might reduce the energy level to low. So that is the search action that we can take from the high state. So let us uh, let's say that the search action in the high state it does not change uh, the battery level. So the state won't change. So let's say the probability is alpha when and the search action in the state high might not change the state or the energy level might drop to the low uh, with the probability of 1 minus alpha. So in both these cases the robot's search returns a reward of R search. So the robot can also wait and waiting for the cans and does not change that battery, does not drain the battery. So the state does not change and in both the cases we'll have the wait action and it will return a reward of R wait. And searching for the cans when the energy level is low might deplete the battery completely and then the robot would have to be rescued and recharged again. So let's write the probability as 1 minus beta and if the robot is rescued then, the, then its battery level is restored. However, needing rescue returns a negative reward of R rescued uh, which we have mentioned as minus 3 because the robot has messed up. So alternatively the battery might not run out and this occurs when with the probability beta and the robot receives a reward of R search. Or alternatively it can also recharge and the recharge action actually restores the battery to the level high and the robot receives a reward of 0. So that is how we can formulate or draw a transition graph for any MDP. So this is the table that we can use for state transitions. So here you can see the state are high and low and with each state, with the state we have mentioned each action and then the next state. So if the state is high and we search, the action is searched, so we'll be in state high or we'll be in state low. So the probability of being in state high is alpha and the probability of being in state low is 1 minus alpha and we'll return a reward of R search. And similarly for some states you can see the states do not exist because if you are in high state and if we wait so it is not possible to be in to go to low state so the probability will be zero and when we are low state and we wait so it is obvious that we will stay in the low state so the probability will be one so this is the table that mentions states transitions and along with the probabilities and the rewards so in reinforcement learning the agent's goal is to maximize the future reward so which is defined by the reward hypothesis so which actually states that all of what we mean by goals and purposes can be well thought of as a maximization of the expected value for the cumulative sum of received rewards. So which actually means that in reinforcement learning the purpose or the goal of the agent is to maximize the cumulative reward it receives in the long run. So which means that we not only maximize the immediate rewards but also maximize the total future reward. So now let's understand this definition thoroughly. So we say that the return at time step t which is denoted by gt is the sum of rewards obtained after time step t. So the return gt here is a random variable because the dynamics of the MDP can be stochastic. So which means that there is a randomness in both the individual rewards and the state transitions. So in general we can say that there can be many different trajectories from the same state. So which sometimes we may, might get a large return and sometimes we might, might get a smaller return from the same state because there is a randomness in our MDP. So that is why we maximize instead of maximizing this return we maximize the expected return. So which is denoted by this term here this, which is called the expected return. And then for this approach uh, to be well defined the sum of the rewards must be finite. So specifically we can say that uh, there is a final time step t 
uh, where the agent and the environment interaction ends. So in the simplest case, uh, the interaction should naturally break into different chunks, which we also call the episodes. So each episode actually begins independently of, of how the previous previous episode has ended. So let us understand what are episodes and what are episodic tasks. So in simplest case, the interaction of the agent and the environment it breaks naturally into chunks, which are called episodes. And each episodes each episode begins independently of how the previous one ended. And at the termination, the agent is reset to the start state and every episode has a final state which we call the terminal state. So we call these kind of tasks as episodic tasks. So let's take an example of an agent who is trying to solve a maze. So a game of maze always ends with either an agent either solving the maze or hitting the wall. So a single game of maze would constitute an episode. So each game starts from the same start state with the position of the agent reset. And we can also take the example of a tic-tac-toe game where the agent is trying to win the game. So either each episode ends by winning the game or losing the game. So that is either the three axes will be in a sequence or three zeros will be in a sequence. And each episode ends by either winning the game or losing the game. So there are other types of problems with the agent environment interaction. It goes on and it continues without any end. And such type of tasks are called as continuing tasks. So continuing tasks, they cannot be broke up, broken up into independent episodes. So the interaction goes on continually and there are no terminal states also. So let's take the example of a robot who is trying to learn how to work and since the robot and the interaction or with the environment will never end so the robot will go on interacting with the environment continually and the reward for this robot would be negative every time the robot destabilizes. So every action that the robot takes if it destabilizes the robot will give a negative reward and since the robot never stops interacting with the environment so we have to give it a negative reward every time it destabilizes. So also to avoid negative reward the robot would learn to avoid the actions that destabilize it so this is how this is one example of how continuing tasks will work and we can also take the example of a smart thermostat which regulates the temperature of a room so this can be also formulated as an as a continuing task since the thermostat will never stop uh, stop interacting with the environment and the state of the thermostat could be the current temperature along with other details such as the time of the day and the number of people that are present in the building so there are just two actions either to turn on the heater or turn it off so the reward would be negative every time someone has to manually adjust the temperature and otherwise it will be zero reward so to avoid a negative reward the thermostat will learn to anticipate the user's preferences according to the day of the time and the number of people that are present in the building now if you try to uh, sum up all the future rewards as we have done in episodic tasks so now there is one problem that we are summing over an infinite series since this series will never end it will keep on continuing so to solve this problem we'll modify this sum so that it becomes a finite sum so one solution is to discount future rewards by a factor so here gamma which is called the discount factor so the value of the gamma which is a parameter which is called the discount factor it can be zero or less than one so it can be either zero and less than one not one so the effect of discounting on the return will be that the immediate rewards will contribute more to this sum and rewards which are far into the future they will contribute less because they are multiplied by the gamma which are raised by the powers successively so the rewards which are in the future they will have a less contribution compared to the rewards that are currently estimated so we can choose to write this sum as this expression so once we have this expression this expression is now infinite but if you want to make this finite so uh, we'll concisely write the sum as this expression which is uh, guaranteed to be finite so this expression is guaranteed to be finite so to get here from this expression we'll assume that r max is a maximum reward and that our agent can receive so we'll pull this term out of the equation since it will be a constant so because this is the maximum reward that our agent can receive so now the second factor here which we are left with it's just a geometric progression or geometric series and the geometric series it is always a finite series so the r max times 1 divided by 1 minus gamma is a finite and it is the upper bound on the gt so the gt will have the r max multiplied by 1 divided by 1 minus gamma which will be a finite series so now if we look at the gamma value here so if the gamma equals 0 so the return of this function will just uh, be the reward at the next time step and we say that in this case the agent is short-sighted and only cares about the immediate reward not the future rewards 
on the other hand if, if the gamma value is one or is closer to one it cannot be one it can be closer to one so if it approaches one the immediate reward and the future rewards uh, both are counted nearly equally in this return so in this case we say that the agent is far sighted so now our agent actually counts both the immediate rewards and the future rewards so that is why we said that the agent is far sighted so now let us discuss a simple and one more property very very important property for the returns so which we call as the recursive nature of the returns so the returns can be written recursively using this particular equation so we have pulled out gamma from the term starting from the second term in our sum and the sequence in the parenthesis here is actually the return on the next time step that is t plus 1 so we can write this particular term as the return at time t plus 1 which should be g t plus 1 so now we have a recursive equation with g t on the left hand side and g t plus 1 on the right hand side so later on this term is actually the return at time t plus 1 which is equal to g t plus 1 so this is the equation that we get finally where on the left hand side we have g t which is the return at time t and we have on the right hand side g t plus 1 which is the return at time t plus 1 so later on we will use this equation to design our learning algorithms so earlier we have discussed that the agent's role in an interaction is to choose an action on each time step. So the choice of the action has an immediate impact on both the immediate reward and the next state. So in this video we will describe what are policies and how an agent selects these actions. So a policy maps each state to a single action and we use the Greek letter pi to denote a policy and pi of s represents the action selected in state s by the policy pi. So if the agent is following a policy pi at time t then pi of a given s is a probability that action a is selected when the state is s and a policy can only depend on the current state and not on any other factor like time or previous states so the current state should have all the information that is used to select the current action so a policy that maps each state to a single action is called a deterministic policy so in this example that we'll see policy pi selects action a1 in state s1 and s2 and it selects action a2 in state s3 so you can notice that the agent can select the same action in multiple states and some actions might not be selected in any state so in general we can say that a policy actually assigns probabilities to each action in each state. So we use the notation pi of a given s to represent the probability of selecting action a in state s. A stochastic policy is the one where the multiple actions may be selected from a single state with non-zero probability. So here we have shown the probabilities over actions from state S1 according to uh, the policy pi. And you have to remember that the pi specifies a separate policy of actions in each state. So for different states, there will be different policies or policy distributions that are specified by the policy pi. So we can say this, that the sum over all the action probabilities must be one for each state since it is a probability distribution. So the sum over all the action probabilities must, must be equal to one and each probability must be non-negative. So each action should have a probability that is non-negative. So in conclusion, an agent's behavior is specified by a policy that maps the state to a probability distribution of different actions. And a policy can only depend on the current state and not on any other factors such as time or previous states. So in reinforcement learning, a reward captures the short term gain. However, our objective is to learn a policy that achieves the most reward in the long run. So we use value functions to formalize this notion. So we'll start by understanding what is a state value function. So a state value function is the future reward that can that an agent can expect uh, starting from a particular state under a policy pi. So more precisely, the state value function is the expected return from a given state. So GT is our return and we are in state S. So this is the expected return and we denote our state value function using V of pi of S. So the agent's behavior uh, will also determine how much reward it can expect in the long run. So a value function is defined with respect to a given policy. Here we have specified a policy pi and where our return is gt which is given by this expression that we have seen uh, before. So we can also define an action value function. So an action value function describes what happens when the agent first selects a particular action and then follows a policy pi. So more precisely the action value of a state is the expected return if the agent selects an action a and then follows a policy pi. So here our return is gt and we are in 
state S and we took an action A. So what is the expected return when an agent selects an action A and then follows a policy P? So value functions are basically used to judge the quality of different policies and a value function also allows an agent uh, to determine the quality of its current situation instead of just waiting and looking to observe the long term outcome and value functions basically also summarize all the possible futures by averaging over the results. So in reinforcement learning, the agent's goal is to avoid negative rewards in the future by recognizing similar experiences in the past when it got a negative reward. So in reinforcement learning, a similar idea that allows us to relate the value of the current state to value of future states without actually waiting to observe all the future rewards, which is called the Bellman equations. So we use the Bellman equations to formalize the connection between the value of a state and its possible next states. And we also use Bellman equations to relate current and future values. So Bellman equations express a relationship between the value of a state and its possible next states and also it, they can be used to express a relationship between the state action pairs and the next state action pairs. So the Bellman equation for a state value function uh, defines the relationship between the value of a state and the value of its next possible states. So let's start by recalling that the state value function is defined as the expected return starting from the state S. And recall that the return is defined as the discounted sum of future rewards given here. And we have seen previously that the return at time t can be written recursively as an immediate reward plus the discounted return as a return at time t plus 1. So the gt plus 1 is a discounted return at time t plus 1 and this is an immediate reward. So now let's expand uh, this particular equation. So first we'll expand and the expected return as a sum of uh, all the possible action choices that are made by our agent and second we expand uh, over the probability distribution and uh, over the possible rewards and the next states uh, condition on state s and action a this is our next state and this is the reward possible rewards and next state on this part current state and current action so we can break it down in this order because uh, the action choices depends only on the current state so while the next state and the reward they only depend on the current state and action so this result is actually a weighted sum of terms consisting of immediate reward plus an expected future return uh, from the state as prime so here all we have done is just explicitly write uh, the expectation as it is defined so it is a sum of all the possible outcomes weighted by the probability that they occur so this is a sum of all the possible outcomes and this is weighted by the probability that they occur and you can also notice that this t plus this uh, this rt plus one is a random variable while this particular r small r uh, represents each possible reward that we receive or reward outcome and the expected return it depends on states and rewards that are infinitely far into the future which, are, which is represented by or gamma here and this is expected return uh, which depends on states and rewards infinitely far into the future so we can also notice that this particular term here is the expected return uh, is a definition of the expected return for the value function for the state as prime so for state as prime this is the expected return and the definition of the value function so the only difference here is that uh, the time index is t plus 1 instead of t so and this is also not an issue because neither the policy nor the p which is the probability distribution they depend on time so if we replace this one with v pi of s prime which is the expected uh, return for the state s prime so we'll get this equation which is called the bellman equation for the state value function so we'll use this equation later on to find the value functions for different states and represent each state uh, in relationship with the values of the future states so we can also drive a similar equation for the action value function so it will be a recursive equation for the value of the state action pair in terms of the next state action pairs so in this case when we expand the equation you can see that the equation does not begin with the policy selecting an action as it was in our state action value function and this is because the action is already fixed as a part of our state action pair so again we have a weighted sum of terms consisting of immediate reward that is r and plus the expected future return given by a specific next state that is s prime so so unlike the Bellman equation for the state value function we cannot just stop here because we want a recursive equation for the value of state action pairs in terms of the ne next state action pair so at the at this moment we just have the expected return given by one state that is as prime so we don't have any action included here so now to change this uh, we can express the expected return from the next state as a sum of the agents possible action choices so in particular
particular we can change the expectation to be conditioned on both the next state and the next action which is given by s prime and a prime and then sum over all the possible actions using the summation here so here each term is uh, weighted by the probability under pi of selecting uh, the action a prime under the state s prime so now if you look at this particular equation or this particular part here you can see that this is the expected return is the definition of the uh, value function for the s prime and a prime so this is this expected return is just the definition for the action value function for s prime and a prime a prime so if we replace this we'll get uh, this equation here so uh, we'll, this is the bellman equation that we'll use for the action value function which uh, where this is the same equation here that represents this part which is uh, the action value function for uh, the state s prime and the action a prime so this is the action value function or the bellman equation for the action value functions so later on we'll uh, discuss why this relationship is so fundamental in reinforcement learning and how we can use it to design algorithms which can efficiently estimate the value of value functions so now let's look at some examples of the bellman equations uh, to get some clarity so we'll start with our first example so let's say there are three states s1 s2 and s3 and the returns that are given by each state as 0 minus 0 0.1 minus 0 0.1 and 1 so if you transition from state s1 to s1 with the probability of transitioning is 0 0.3 and the return that it will give you or the reward that it will give you is minus 0 0.1 and if you transition from state s1 to s2 probability of transitioning is 0 0.7 and the reward that you will get is minus 0 0.1 and if you are in state 2 and you transition to state 1 the probability of transitioning to state s1 is 0 0.6 and you will get a reward of minus 0 0.1 and if you are in s2 and you transition to state s3 which is the final state here so the probability of doing that is 0 0.4 and the reward that you will get is plus 1 and from s3 you cannot go anywhere because that is the final state so now let's write bellman, uh, bellman equation for the state value functions using this particular mdp so let's assume that the value of gamma here is 0 0.9 which we will see later how to take the value of, of gamma so we will take the value of gamma is 0 0.9 so let's calculate the bellman equation for each state so we'll start with the first state that is s1 so our v is uh, v of s1 is this one so here since our action policy is only to transition from one state to another so the first term in our bellman equation the probability of each action will be one that is why that term is not included so if we have multiple actions with different probabilities so we would have to take those probabilities in account as well so here our probability is one for each action that is why the first term will be one so we'll focus on the next term that is probability of uh, selecting s1 when we are already in s1 so if you look at this particular action here so the action was to transition from state s1 to s1 so we'll calculate uh, the state value function for the s1 so our first term here is this one so here p of s1 given we are in s1 which is the probability of selecting s1 when we are in s1 state so it is 0 0.3 and then the reward that we'll get is minus 0 0.1 and the value of gamma that we have chosen is 0 0.9 and then v of s1 is what we are calculating here so we'll get an equation of this form and the second term uh, the second transition that we can do from state s1 is to s2 uh, which has a probability of 0 0.7 and then reward that we'll get is minus 0 0.1 and then and the value of gamma is 0.9 and then we have the value of state s2 that we'll calculate later on so the final equation that we'll get is this equation this this is our state value function uh, using the bellman equation for the state s1 so now let's calculate it uh, calculate the same for the s2 so if you calculate the same state value function using the bellman equation for s2 state you will get this equation where this term will be the transition to state s1 and this term will be the transition to state s3 and if you calculate the state value function for the state s3 it will be zero because we are not transitioning to any other state from s3 so now we have three equations and this is called a system of linear equations so we have three equations and three unknowns that is v of s1 v of s2 and v of s3 so you can use online calculator or if you know how to solve system of linear equations you can solve it and after solving you will get these particular values so for each state we have a state value function or the state value so the value is 0 minus uh, 0 0.293 and 0 0.498 and the value for the state s3 is 0 so this is how we use bellman equations to calculate the state value functions for our different states in an mdp so let's discuss another example which is called the grid world so in grid world our different states are represented by rectangular boxes so suppose that we have four states called s1 s2 s3 and s4 and our policy that our agent is can select is either the agent can go up 
upwards, rightwards, downwards, or leftwards. So there are four actions that our agent can choose in each particular state. And suppose if you are in eight state S1, and if you choose the action right, so you will transition to state S2. So you will get a reward of zero. And if you are in S3, and if you choose the upward action, the agent selects the upward action, so it will transition to the state S1. So it will get a reward of zero. And the same happens when you transition from S2 to S1 to S3. So the only time that we get a reward is when we transition from any state to S4. So if you are in S3 and you choose the rightward action and you transition to S4, so you'll get a reward of plus 10. And if you are in S2, if you transition to S4 using the downward actions, then also you'll get a reward of plus 10. And suppose if you are in S4 and you press the right button or the rightwards action, so you'll bounce back into the same state that is S4 and that all, then also you'll get a reward of plus 10. And if you are in S4 and you press the downward action, you'll bounce back to the same state that is S4, so you'll get a reward of plus 10. And this happens in every single state. So if you are in S2 and you press the right button or the right words action and the agent selects the right action, so it will bounce back to the state S2 with a reward of 0. And the same will happen in every single state. So now let's assume the value of gamma equals 0 0.7. So we'll take the gamma, of, uh, the value of gamma is 0 0.7 and we'll calculate the value function, the state value function for each state using the Bellman equation. So this is our Bellman equation. So here, if we simplify this, so this part will be 1 because the probability of transitioning from any state to any other state is 1. So we'll take this probability as 1, but our action probability will be different. So here are, if you are in state S3, let's calculate the value function for the state S3 first. So if you are in state S3, so based on the actions that you take in S3, we'll sum up all the values. So here R is the return that you will get after transitioning and gamma value is 0 0.7. So this is the value of S3 that we'll get. So the first transition can be if the agent selects the right action, so it will transition from the state S3 to S4. The reward will be plus 10 because we are transitioning into S4. And then the next value is zero, the gamma value is 0 0.7. And then the value of the state S4 that we don't know yet. And then plus the next transition can be from S3 to S1. So it will be 1 by 4 since the probability of selecting each action is 1 by 4. So we'll get 0 0.7 because the return value is 0. And the next expected value for the next state is a value for state S1 that we don't know yet. So other next third term that we have added is when we choose action. So if you choose the right action, you will get this probability, uh, this uh, term here. And if you choose the upward action, you will get this term. And if you choose to go down or go leftwards in S3, so that will be counted as two actions. So when, when you combine that, you will get this 1 by 2, uh, 0 0.7 into value of S3 because you will bounce back to the same state that is S3. So this is the equation for the state value function using the Bellman equation for state S3. So now let's calculate it for all the states. So this is these are the four equations that you will get when you calculate the state value functions for all of these states. So once you have these four equations, you have a system of linear equations. You have four variables and four unknowns, or sorry, four equations and four unknowns, and you can solve it uh, using matrices or you can uh, use online calculators also to solve uh, this system of linear equations. And after you solve these equations, uh, you will get the value for each state. So the value, the state value for the state S3 is 7.98, for state S1 is 3.38 and for state S2 is 7.98 and for state S4 is 11.99 so the highest state value is 11.99 so if you are in S2 and if you want for agent wants to know which state is best so it will look at the state values the state values for the S4 state is the highest that is 11.99 so we can directly transition to the state that has the highest state value and the same will happen if our agent is in state S3 and if it wants to know which action is the best or which state is the best so you can look at the state values for each state and then we can transition to that particular state. So for small MTPs where we have small number of states and probabilities, so we can use system of linear equations to find the value functions using the Bellman equations. But for larger problems where we have lots of thousands of states, it is not feasible to use system of linear equations. So later on in this course, we'll use other methods using the Bellman equations for MTPs that have lot or a huge number of states. So till now we have seen that a policy specifies how an agent behaves and given this way of behaving, uh, we then aim to find the value function. So our ultimate goal is to find a policy that obtains as much reward as possible in the long run. So in this video, we'll achieve this notion with the help of the optimal policies and optimal value functions. So an optimal policy which is denoted by pi star is a policy which is as good as or better than all other policies. So we say that a policy pi 1 is 
as good as or better than the policy pi 2 if and only if the value under pi 1 is greater than or equal to the value under pi 2 for each and every single state so which means that an optimal policy will have the highest possible value in every state and there is always at least one optimal policy but there may be more than one as well so now the value function for an optimal policy has the greatest value possible in each and every single state so we can express that mathematically by writing that pi star of s is equal to the maximum value over all the policies so this will hold for every single state in our state space and the value of for an optimal policy is defined to be the largest of all the computed values and we could repeat this for every single state and the value for an optimal policy would always be the largest so all optimal policies have the same optimal state value function which is denoted by v star here so optimal policies also share the same action value function uh, which is again the maximum for every state action pair so we denote this shared action uh, value function by q star here so right now let's move on and we can uh, rewrite the bellman equations for the state value functions in a special form so in this form we don't actually reference the policy itself so there always exists an optimal deterministic policy that will help us select an optimal action in every single state so such a deterministic optimal policy will assign probability one for an action that achieves the highest value and for all other actions it will assign a probability of zero so that is how we can express uh, this another way by replacing uh, the sum over pi star here with the maximum over a so we have derived a relationship that applies directly to v star itself here so we call this special form the bellman optimality equation for v star so we can make the same replacement in the bellman equation for action value function so which will give us the bellman optimality equation for q star so earlier we have discussed how the bellman equations form a linear system of equations uh, that can be solved by standard methods so optimality equations also give us a similar system of equations but now the system will not be a linear system of equ equations since we are taking the maximum number of actions and the maximum taking maximum over actions uh, will not return as a linear system so later on in this course uh, we'll use different methods to solve these equations and we'll also see how the correspondence between the optimal value functions and optimal policies will help us derive reinforcement learning algorithms just a quick info guys if you are interested in doing an end-to-end -end certification course in reinforcement learning then intellipath provides the reinforcement learning training course you can check out the course detail in the description below this brings us to the end of this session. If you have any query, do comment below and we would love to help you out. Thank you.